the roles of V1 and other cortical areas in visual selection. Part 1. Using depth feature to probe the contribution by extra-stride cortex. We have shown various pieces of evidence that V1 computes a saliency map to guide visual selection exogenously. Now let's ask, does V1 compute saliency alone? Or do extra stride cortical areas also contribute? From this diagram, we see this control by the superior colliculus to move the eyes. V1 projects to this control, and so does higher brain areas, including the extra stride cortex. Expanding this diagram a little bit, the extra stride cortical areas include V2, V3, V4, and T, etc. V1 projects to the superior curriculus. These extra stride control areas also project to the superior curriculus. What kind of control do they contribute additionally? To answer this question, let's use depth feature by stereo vision to distinguish between the role of V1 and the extra stride areas. With two eyes, we can tell whether something is near or far by matching the two retinal positions of each object in our brain. This match tells us that the object is near, and this match says that the object is far. Each match is between a location in the image for the left eye and a location in the image for the right eye. And the difference between these two image locations is the binocular disparity. When this disparity is positive, the object in a 3D space is nearer than the 3D location where the gazes from the two eyes converge. And a negative disparity means that the object is further than this binocular fixation point. If the match is incorrect, in this example, the left eye image location is for the object number one, and the right eye image location is for the object number two, then one would perceive this ghost object in space. Such a false match is more likely to occur when the two objects appear similar, so their images for the two eyes are also similar. There are neurons tuned to binocular disparities to signal these matches in V1 and extra cortex. However, V1 neurons respond to both true and false matches, but extra neurons prefer true matches. So this suggests that Proper depth perception in stereo vision is associated with visual cortical areas beyond V1. We have seen that segmenting the two textures in this image becomes difficult when we superpose onto it this irrelevant image to make this composite image. By the V1 saliency mechanisms, we have understood how these irrelevant horizontal and vertical bars interfere with the task. Now we ask whether separating these two images in depth could reduce this interference. In this case, uh, the irrelevant image is placed behind the relevant one. We could also ask if swapping their depth order could make things slightly more difficult, but perhaps still easier than the case when these two images are not separate in depth. If uh, these different depth arrangements can make a difference in the texture segmentation task, they should suggest a role by the extra stride cortex. For such a depth arrangement, let's see what images should be shown to the two eyes. Start with identical composite images to the left eye and to the right eye, both images have the relevant and irrelevant image components. For the left eye, shift the irrelevant image component slightly to the left by a distance x. For the right eye, shift the same image component but slightly to the right by a distance x. Therefore, the binocular disparity for the relevant image is zero since we did not shift this component in either eye but a binocular disparity of minus 2x is created for the irrelevant image component 
So this is the perception after the two monocular images are fused for stereo vision. Now, if we swap the images between the two eyes, we should then see the irrelevant image as in front, since its binocular disparity should not be positive. Let's denote this composite image after this minus x shift as i com minus x and call this i com plus x and of course call the original unshifted version as i com zero. So let's organize in this way. With these dichotic inputs to the two eyes, the stereo perception should have the task relevant image in front. And with these inputs, the task relevant image is behind. And we like to compare them to this situation when the same composite image, I come zero, without any shifts shown to both eyes. In this case, the task relevant image is not separated from the interfering image in depth. So if we ask observers to find the texture border in the task relevant image, let's say that this takes this much reaction time to do it in this 2D situation, but takes them this reaction time to do it when it is 3D in front, and this reaction time when the task relevant plane is behind in 3D space. So does the reaction time become shorter with a depth separation? And does it become even easier when the task relevant image is in front? To be fair, we should include a control situation when a monocular image for the 3D version is shown to both eyes. This creates a 2D perception of this image. And if this is the reaction time for the texture segmentation task in this 2D case, it turns out that this reaction time is actually shorter than the unshifted 2D case. This is because shifting or small separation of the image in 2D already reduces the interference somewhat, even without the 3D depth separation. Therefore, to see whether 3D depth makes a difference, we should compare only between these three situations and ask whether having the depth separation helps and whether having the relevant plane in front in the 3D space helps. Experimental data show that the answer is yes to each of them, but only for those observers whose reaction times are sufficiently long, longer than 1000 millisecond for the time it takes for them to press a button to report whether the texture border is in the left half or right half of their visual field. In other words, 3D depth separation does not speed up this texture segmentation task if observers can do it sufficiently quickly by 2D information alone. These observers are quicker perhaps because they have had sufficient experience on such segmentation tasks. For example, these are the reaction times in milliseconds. The blue data bars are for the 2D inputs and the red data bars are for the 3D front inputs. The horizontal axis indicates combinations of observers and experimental image conditions to make the segmentation less or more difficult. They are listed in the order of rising reaction times to do the segmentation task. For example, this is a pair of reaction times by subject NG in experiment one. The reaction times are quite short and there's no difference between the reaction times for the 2D and 3D input cases. The same conclusion holds for these observers in experiment one. Their reaction times are shorter than about 1000 millisecond. This pair of reaction times is for by subject SI in experiment 2. Both reaction times are longer than 1000 millisecond, and uh, the reaction time for the 2D input is significantly longer 
than that for 3D front input. The same conclusion holds for these observers, some in experiment 1 and some in experiment 2. All of them have reaction times longer than about 1000 millisecond. Here are the analogous reaction times for comparing between the 3D front and 3D behind cases. The green data bars are for the 3D behind inputs and the red data bars are for the 3D front inputs. When the reaction times are shorter than about 1000 milliseconds, the depth order does not matter. When the depth order does matter so that the reaction times are longer when the task relevant image is behind in 3D space, they occur only when the reaction times are longer than about 1000 millisecond. Therefore, these 3D depths and 2D image processing data suggest that if V1 saliency mechanisms can work sufficiently quickly to guide attention, then cortical areas beyond V1 may not contribute to attentional guidance by external visual inputs.